everybody. We are so excited today. We are here to talk about the big summer box office. This is going to be a kind of a wrap up of what we, our predictions uh, for uh, this summer and just talk about the summer as a whole. And I'm Rachel and my friend Conrado is here to talk about all this with me. Yep. I'm right here. Ready to talk. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, yeah. So have you had a good summer? I I would say so. I would say so. Um, I have to say I haven't seen a lot of the movies in the top 10, but I have seen some good movies this summer, so I can't complain. Oh, good. Well, let's start by going over our predictions, and then oh, we'll go over okay. what actually happened. <laughs> All right. Just real quick, just listing them off, what our predictions were, and we can mm -hmm. see how poorly, at least I know I did. <laughs> <laughs> so... All right. My predictions were, number one, Avengers Infinity War, number two, Incredibles 2, number three, Jurassic World 2, Fallen Kingdom, four, Solo, uh, five, Deadpool 2, six, Ant-Man and the Wasp, seven, Mission Impossible Fallout, eight, Hotel Transylvania 3, nine, Skyscraper, and ten, Ocean's 8. So I really didn't do that bad. <laughs> not too bad not yeah. too bad um i think i have we had pretty similar predictions and i think uh, yeah. the recurring theme is we have the right movies just in the sort of the wrong order yeah at least that's what's going on a lot in my predictions which were number one the incredibles 2 number two avengers infinity wars number three solo star wars story so you can see a trend of things going worse as they go with my predictions <laughs> number four Deadpool 2, number 5, Jurassic World, Fallen Kingdom, number 6, Mission Impossible, Fallout, number 7, Endman and, and the Wasp, number 8, Ocean's 8, number 9, Hotel Transylvania 3, and number 10, Disney's Christopher Robin. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, so I actually saw all of the movies on my list except for Deadpool 2, and mm -hmm. on the actual top 10 list, I saw all of them but uh but deadpool too <laughs> so okay. yeah. well, uh so i had you know i had a pretty pretty busy uh busy summer uh at the at the box office uh and uh, but i still got to see some fun indies and we'll talk about too and some that uh the dark horses and other stuff that uh, we we're recording this on the 26th of August and uh, particularly uh, it is possible that the Meg could sneak in there into the number 10 slot but it's also pop it's it's also possible that Crazy Rich Asians could definitely uh, have legs and it's already it only uh, reduced in its second week only reduced by like point five percent or something crazy five percent yeah which is nuts and never happens it's always like 40 to 50 percent is like considered pretty good and mm -hmm. so it's doing really really well which makes me super happy yeah. because i really um, like yeah i don't think the word crazy rich i would say crazy rich asians doesn't just have a chance of getting into the top 10 i think it definitely is and i think uh, right now, I think it's well on its way to make like $170 million or so, mm -hmm. which would put it, you know, just behind Mission Impossible yeah. right now, which would be number seven or eight on the chart, which is really good for, a, you know, sort of like an old fashioned romantic comedy of the kind that we hadn't seen in a long time, Yeah, at least from Hollywood. So yeah. I'm excited about that. Yeah, they are. They've got to be super excited. Thirty million dollar budget. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a. Uh, I don't think we've had this kind of romantic comedy hit since. I don't know. I can't think of anything since like Greek Wedding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that even was an independent production. So right, right. That's true. Um, it's a pretty big deal. Yeah, and uh, so it, I guess they're. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was just gonna say. I mean, of course, it, people are. Are rightfully very excited about uh, the diversity of the cast, but I'm most and and that's all amazing. But I'm just so excited because I love romantic comedies, and I'm just very excited that not only did we get one that's good, uh, but 
you know that it's that it is diverse and it's doing so well and and uh i'm just hoping that uh we we get a whole bunch of new fun romantic comedies because i really enjoy them yeah i think those are both things that i want more diverse movies and more romantic comedies give me yeah. both i'm very happy about that um, I guess our disclaimer is we're going to go through the top 10 as it stands right now, right? Yeah. Just with the understanding that there are a couple movies like Crazy Rich Asians are probably going to end up in the top 10 at the end of right. uh, the summer. Right. Well, I mean, at the end of the year, really, when all is said and done. But... Right. Because currently, as it sits on the 26th, Crazy Rich Asians is in 14th place. But we know that that will not last mm -hmm. <laughs> for sure yeah <laughs> and in in any case neither of us really thought that crazy rich asians could uh was going to end up in the top yeah. 10 so you, neither of us had it. you mentioned it as, I did mention it as a possibility yeah because yeah. i i had the impression that it could you know gather a lot of uh interest because of uh you know because of what we talked about because of the diverse casting mm -hmm. the you know the fact that we haven't seen a lot of big hollywood movies with asian cast and also the romantic comedy thing. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad to see that it did well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really happy, like I said, both uh, that it did well, both critically and and you know, financially. So, yay. <laughs> uh, so, all right, well, let's talk about, let's go through the actual current top 10. Uh, we have at tenth place at the moment. We have uh, Mama Mia, Mama Mia. Here we go again. I really debated uh -huh. about this, putting it in my list, but I went for Skyscraper instead. <laughs> the second time, The Rock has let me down on my top ten <laughs> predictions. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Mama Mia. Here we go again. Uh, it had a uh, total U.S. gross of 115, uh, total worldwide gross of 345 million dollars. I I actually really enjoyed it. I thought it was effervescent and fun, and you know, just fun escapist entertainment. I thought the singing was much better than in the original, and I don't know. I just I, there was there if people were expecting a lot of Meryl Streep. I would be disappointed uh and the uh, advertising was definitely pretty pretty shady on that but uh <laughs> but i don't know i thought it was sweet and just a fun little movie Personally. well the first mamma mia was a really big hit and i also yeah. thought about putting it in my top 10 and i ultimately decided against it and even though it's number 10 right now i think we can we get a pretty good sense that it's not going to remain in the top 10 by the end of the summer i think mm -hmm. at least one or two movies are going to push it out of it but um you know it was a pretty big hit on its own 115 million uh in the u.s is nothing to sneeze at and right. um i mean it's i think a better movie than the original mamma mia but at the same time i don't think it's a particularly good one still and the thing about the original is that it's kind of so strange and bizarre that it's more, I find it more fascinating and entertaining in a way just because it's so sort of bonkers. And this new Mamma Mia, it's a little better, but that also makes it a little more boring to me, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I can see that. I I just purely like the musical sequences and just how just the sort of effervescent fun tone. <laughs> Uh, I, they were I pretty well singing, done. I thought the singing was much better, personally. That yeah, yeah. That's a that I can't argue with that. That <laughs> is for sure. Uh, and I did like the way that they never, um, uh, for lack of a better word, slut shamed the Lily James character. Like they just presented her choices, and that was it. And kind of like mm. that. And I liked all three of the guys i thought they were pretty good for like pretty convincing uh, you know younger versions of our three characters and mm. i mean it's a silly movie the plot is terrible there's like tons of plot holes it's not like a great movie but i was entertained it was escapism for me i think that's what they were going for so yeah. you know good in them <laughs> 
yeah, there you go. For achieving uh, their goal. Yeah. So, okay. all right. Well, next on our list is uh, at number nine is Oceans 8. And so we both had this on our list. I had it at 10. Uh, you had it higher, I think, right? Yeah, I had it at number eight. Yeah. So it ended up at number nine. And so, yeah, it made $138 million, uh, $70 million budget, and a total worldwide $289 million. And honestly, I was disappointed in it. I, it's not, I thought once the heist got going, I thought it got to be entertaining. But honestly, for like the first 45 minutes, I was pretty bored. I had a lot of what I hate in action movies is characters staring at screens talking. I think that's so boring. Mm. And it had a lot of characters staring at screens talking about their plan. And it just wasn't interesting to me. And I thought a lot of the actresses were actually kind of underused. And like especially Kate Blanchett. And I don't know. I it it won me over by the end, so I gave it a marginal recommendation because I did think the actual actual heist was fun but hmm. i i don't know i was kind of bored for a lot of it so it was a disappointment um, that was really exciting yeah work. i uh i think that is like the more popular opinion about this movie i get the sense that most people were a little disappointed by it uh i am not one of those people i mean i am i guess relative to my expectations i was really excited about the movie and it is not you know, the greatest movie I've ever seen, which is what I wanted it to be. But I thought it was pretty good. I think it was really entertaining. I will agree with you on a number of points, though. I will agree that the second half of the movie is more entertaining and better than the first half, even though I do really like the beginning of the movie when Sandra Bullock gets out of prison and she starts running the little, you know, those little cons that the... Um, at Macy's, basically, mm -hmm. getting the makeup and that sort of thing, getting a hotel room. I thought that was a pretty cool uh, part of the movie. Yeah, but then it kind of slacks a little bit, and then it recovers when it would come to the actual height, like you said. Mm -hmm. And I do agree as well that some of the supporting characters were underused. Um, but then again, it was a movie full of great actresses, and it took place at the Met Ball with all these amazing gowns and Rihanna looked amazing and Sandra Bullock was so good. And, you know, the supporting cast was also mostly really good. I had a great time with the movie. Um, even though I recognize that it has flaws, it really, I just went with it and I had a good time. Cool. Good. I'm glad. Uh, yeah. I gave it a marginal. I give it basically like a C plus, like it's a, just barely a recommendation. Cause I think there was enough there to recommend it because of the ending, but it was mm. i was hoping i would love it but anyway yeah all yeah, right it would be more of a, like a b would be my grade for the movie yeah. that's fair okay so next we have uh hotel transylvania three summer vacation that came in at number eight 158 million dollars and not uh wrong on, in the u.s and the overseas uh Call that I have is 301 million. Um, I don't know if those are the numbers that you're working with for the international, but um, pretty big hit. And the whole yeah. trend of many movies keep keep making good some good amount of money. I think this is the most successful one of the three, right? Um, I, I I'm not sure if it if it actually ended up crossing the the second one, uh, but I know it made more than the first. I'm sure of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the second one I have here made 169. So it hasn't caught up to the second one, but maybe it'll catch up to it. It's definitely a big hit. And I think it's, you know, the difference between the two is not so big. So they are performing pretty steadily, which I, I'm sure their studio, Sony Animation, is pretty psyched about that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, because I wondered if it was going to heard it at all you know being moving because they'd done so well in uh the um uh for themselves in the uh fall in september uh, and sometimes mm. that doesn't really work out that well you know kind of moving but it worked out well and and i have to say i i enjoyed it i i actually ended up seeing it twice <laughs> um i thought sure. that it was 
it's probably my favorite of the three it's like it, i'm not gonna remember it come oscar season it's not some great movie but i thought it had enough laughs for me i think that gendy is able to with just the way he he animates things he just i don't know it was charming and it was pretty and uh there were some pretty scenes of like the boat and underwater and i kind of like the animation style the villain was completely unnecessary like you literally you did not need his character mm-hmm. for the story at all and uh and so that was frustrating but uh i don't know overall i just thought it was kind of a fun little movie and uh mm. I thought they used the ensemble better than the second one. Uh, and I love Fran Drescher. So that made me happy. Mm-hmm. She got more Eunice. Uh, so overall, I enjoyed it. I thought it was, I thought it was entertaining. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I didn't get around to it, but I did rewatch. I was intending to watch the third one, and I did watch the first and second Hotel Transylvania this summer, on, you know, on DVD, basically. and. Um, I had only seen the first one when it came out in theaters, and I really thought it was really bad back when it came out. Uh But watching it for a second time and then watching the second one, I could see more of, you know, the sort of Gendy Tartakovsky animation style and how he's using sort of character movement, Uh which I think is really the strength of the movies. They do a lot of, like, interesting animation in the way the characters move and their faces change yeah. and all that sort of thing. I think that was really cool. That is what I wouldn't call either of the two Transylvania movies that I saw great, but I think there's a lot of really cool stuff in them yeah. for people who are interested in animation. And everything that I've heard, including from you, is that the third one is the best of the three. So I'm really curious yeah. to see see it because I think, and people, what they've been saying is that it has a lot it's the one that has the most personality coming from, you know, Tartakovsky in yeah. the animation. So I'm excited to see that. Because the first one, it's a miracle. It's watchable with what happened in production. Uh, it just, mm-hmm. I mean, he, he, he just salvaged it. Uh, it, it so it's kind of amazing uh, that it's watchable. Uh, but um, yeah, in the second one, I just, I thought that it moved away from our ensemble a little too much. And I didn't like what they decided to do with the ending. I thought it was kind of a cop out. Um, mm. But uh, this third one, I thought it was a fun little comedy for kids. <laughs> so, yeah. And, it and had I'm really, I, funny jokes. yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to see that the movies are doing well because I really would love them to give Gendy Tartakovsky some money to do like an original movie that he really wants to do, that he really gets to flesh out, you know, all of his ideas and all the talent that he has. Because we know that he's an incredibly talented animator. And, you know, for those who don't know, which is probably not so many people who listen to this podcast, if they are, you know, they follow your blog, they're probably animation uh, fans. But... He is the creator of Dexter's Laboratory and Samurai Jack, which were two cartoons on Cartoon Network, which I thought were amazing. And, you know, I would really love to see him do something on the big screen that he really feels passionate about. Yeah. Yeah. There's talks, I guess, of him doing an R-rated film for Sony. So that would be interesting. See what he'd come up with. Very cool. Yeah. And he was also supposed to do a Popeye movie, right? Yeah. Which um, you can find some of the test footage on YouTube and it looks it looks pretty crazy. I don't know if he's ever get to make it, but I'd be interested in seeing it. Yeah. And people say, oh, it got shelved for the Emoji movie, but that's not true. That's being too hard on Sony. <laughs> but anyway. Um, okay. So next, number seven on our countdown uh, was Mission Impossible Fallout. And uh, yeah, so this movie was super fun. I mean, it, it uh it's got incredible action set pieces uh mm-hmm. and that just blow your mind and it just never stops going and everybody is up for it and i enjoyed it i thought it was i thought it was good i didn't think it was like one of the best action movies of these like ever made like some people have said but it was really mm-hmm. good i liked it um, this was definitely one of my favorite movies that I saw this summer and one of the ones that I had the most fun while watching it. Mm-hmm. Um, I will agree with you, though. I mean, 
the action sequences are absolutely incredible and they have been for the last couple movies um uh, the last couple mission impossible movies is what i mean mm-hmm. um and i think this movie is really good and really fun i do think that there is a little bit too much plot in it i think there's like a little bit too much talking a little bit too many twists and turns which are fine and it's cool and everything but you know the real reason we come to see the mission impossible movies at this point is to see tom cruise do some incredible stuff that is going to like barely keep him alive and yeah. um i think this movie delivers on that front a lot of the time but then there's a lot of other stuff that um maybe didn't have to be quiet as long as it is but yeah, i overall i really really enjoyed it and i'm a big fan of the mission impossible movies and i think this is one of the best ones yeah yeah i definitely liked it better than the last one uh but i still think i like ghost protocol a little bit better personally i just think it had a little more heart to it i would Um, agree with that and i guess like when you say it had too much plot i guess like i would always put something personally like edge of tomorrow over something like this because i think as far as action films i think the story is so much more interesting and clever and uh, and it still has really good action. And so yeah. that to me would be better. But like we're talking in degrees because they're both good movies. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I enjoyed it. It was a good movie. I it's not like, yeah. it's not like my favorite style of movie. Uh you know, just it's a little bit exhausting for me, but it was really good. For, they exceeded, they completely achieved what they were going after to do so that's all you can ask from a movie really (laughs) right you know it's kind of like with crazy rich asians like they completely succeeded in what they were trying to do so there you go (laughs) Hmm. um so all right next we have oh did i say the amounts i didn't say the amounts hold on so mission impossible fallout has made 193 million in the u.s and uh had a huge budget 178 Woo. uh yeah. and uh but uh and then uh, combined worldwide 538 million dollars so uh it's doing okay <laughs> but yeah mm-hmm. that's, that was a really big budget for that movie then next we had uh ant-man and the wasp at number six and this uh of course is our sequel to uh the first ant-man and it made 211 million dollars and a total worldwide of 544 million dollars uh we don't know a production budget on here uh it's it's being perceived as somewhat of a, a seems like a somewhat of a disappointment even though it did very well uh it seems like to me that's sort of the perception i don't know if it's just because people are comparing it to black panther and to infinity war um but yeah. i don't think anybody but it made more it. made more than the first Ant-Man, right i think so yeah but i don't think anybody at marvel was expecting it to bring in black panther numbers yeah no that would be insane right <laughs> black panther is like one of the highest grossing movies of all time i don't think people were gonna you know go out for Ant-Man the way they did for Black Panther, there would have been a little unrealistic expectation. Yeah. So I, I think they're probably happy with it. I don't know if we'll get another Ant-Man movie. We'll see, maybe. Um, but overall, I thought this movie was perfectly pleasant and enjoyable. I I had a good time watching it. Uh, I love Paul Rudd. I've had a crush on him since high school. And I thought that Evangeline Lilly was actually much better in this than in the first one. At first, they got rid of that horrible wig. And I thought she was just more, like, natural and wasn't as stiff. And I, I thought that the, the ghost was actually a pretty decent villain. I thought she was pretty well done. So, overall, I enjoyed it. I didn't think it was as funny as the first one. Uh, I missed, I wanted more scenes with those guys. Because I think they're so Michael funny. Michael Pena and yeah, buddy. the whole troop I thought were mm-hmm. so funny in the first one, and I would have liked more of them in this. Uh, but overall, I thought it was fine. Um, yeah, I watched this movie. It was fun. I think I have forgotten a lot about it. Take that <laughs> as you will. 
Yeah. Um, my only note about the movie is not enough Michelle Pfeiffer. I would have liked a little bit more Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah, that's fair. But then again, I would like more Michelle Pfeiffer in almost every movie. Yeah. Then next we have Solo, a Star Wars story, a crushing failure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the box One of the said. big stories of the summer. Yeah. Huh? The failure of the movie that only made, I don't know, a billion dollars. <laughs> no, 392 worldwide, which is, you know, it's pretty bad for a Star Wars movie. For a Star Wars movie, that's the thing. Uh, yeah, so it... Uh, it made 213 million domestic, 179 uh, foreign, 392 total. And the first time I saw this movie, I was like, oh, that was really entertaining. Cause I was, uh, there, I was mixed to negative on Last Jedi, especially the more it sat with me, the more I was like, oh, um, but there were things that I liked but so this was like oh this is the sort of pulpy space adventure that i was hoping to get from these disney star wars movies but i hadn't really gotten um but i hated l3 with a passion i thought she was horrible and i i thought that it should have ended when they finished the kessel run but then went on another 30 minutes and that was a big mistake um but overall i still thought it was entertaining it's certainly not the worst star wars movie that's for sure in my opinion um so yeah i thought it was okay so here's an interesting thing this is the first star wars movie released since i've been born that i haven't seen in the theater and it's also the one that's considered the biggest disappointment at the box office yeah so I don't know. Maybe the, <laughs> you know, the Conrado Falco dollar is the one that keep, is keeping the Star Wars franchise afloat. Yeah. I'm just saying. <laughs> like what you did. You're ruining Star Wars. <laughs> oh, I wish I had that power. Uh, yeah. I mean, and frankly, I felt kind of bad for Ron Howard because I think uh, he did everything that he could. Uh, he had a very hard task in front of him and i don't think it's his fault and i but i never for a second felt like i was actually watching han solo not even for a minute mm. <laughs> but well, just if, if yeah, i was watching I think... like the space cowboy guy like random you know mm-hmm. adventure then sh- sure it was fine it was perfectly harmless except for i hated l3 so much um mm. Well, it, it seems that it was just a bad idea. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. just in terms of box office and popularity, having a hand Solo movie, probably a bad idea. Having so many Star Wars movies come out so close, close to each to other, other, probably a bad idea. You know, um, mm-hmm. so maybe we can go back to the time when we had a Star Wars movie every couple of years. Maybe go back to the time when we had a Star Wars movie not come out at all. Maybe that's too much to ask. But... <laughs> you know yeah we'll see what dream. we'll see what jj can do i do not envy him at all his job he has a very difficult task to put <laughs> ahead of him uh for this next one uh but we'll see he can be a miracle worker we will uh, see make people happy and whatever um but anyway so there you go that was solo it's the movie everybody's already forgotten like as even if you didn't like the prequels like I feel like they were at least sort of memorable, but like nobody is talking. Like, can you even imagine that like mm-hmm. a Star Wars movie has come out and nobody is talking about it and it was just in May? Like, what? Crazy. It is kind of crazy. Well, I think that's, you know, to go again to the thing of too many movies too close to each other because the Star Wars movie is part of what makes them so you know, people want to talk about them, I think, is that they are seen as sort of an event. And that was definitely the case with the prequels. And then we had all that time between prequels and these new movies in which people, that was all they could talk about. And we know that people love to obsess about Star Wars. So, but when you get a new movie every year, then at some point you're going to, you know, yeah, it stops being so special. Yeah. Honestly, I think people are talking more about the Clone Wars TV show being <laughs> rebooted than about Solo. I genuinely think that's true, which is crazy. But anyway, let's move on. So then at number 
four, we had Deadpool 2. This movie uh, made uh, $318 million uh, in the United States and $415 million domestic, I mean, worldwide. And uh, yeah, so $733 million worldwide. <laughs> uh, $110 million budget. So they did well. I didn't see mm -hmm. it, so I don't really have a lot to say. Uh, about I haven't it. seen it either. So. Um, but it seems to have done pretty well. Um, not as well as the first Deadpool, right? Which was, a, from my, what I remember, it was a huge hit. Yeah. So it made a little less than the original Deadpool, which made 363. This new one's made 318, um, which is, you know, a small dip. Um, but, you know, considering the big Deadpool came sort of out of nowhere and became this huge hit, um, probably a little bit of a disappointment. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. I mean, it's it, it made, uh, I guess, it, the original made $783 million worldwide uh, as opposed mm -hmm. to 700 Compared to only 400 it's it's a big difference, I guess. Oh, no. How much no, it? world worldwide it made. So it's 700 the Deadpool 2 made so, 733 oh. Deadpool 1 so made it, yeah. 783. So it's just a little different. Oh, no. So they're probably pretty happy about it. Yeah, I'm sure they're very happy about it. Um, so, yeah. There you go. Uh, next, we have at number three, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> uh, so this movie uh, made $413 million domestic. Eight hundred eighty-two million foreign, one billion two hundred ninety-five oh, million. <laughs> so, yeah, it's wow. I had no idea that was the case. Yeah, yeah, it did very, very well. People love dinosaurs. That's just the fact. It wow. Doesn't matter. I mean. <laughs> I think the average person must love dinosaurs more than I do. And I love dinosaurs because I didn't even go to see this movie. But <laughs> I mean, it, it looks like a lot of people did. So this movie, it has lots of problems, but I really dislike Jurassic World. And I felt like it was a little bit better, actually, than Jurassic World. I just felt like it at least had a director that had some flair and some style and made some interesting choices which made it more pleasant to watch there's some scenes that have sort of like a horror vibe that gets a little creepy and fun and that i enjoyed and i thought the initial opening sequence on the island was kind of fun it's completely spoiled in the trailer the trailers for this were absolutely horrible and i thought that they did a little better with claire's character and making her more interesting than just some like ice queen of business like she was in the original um but it's not a good movie and the next one is going to be horrible the like the 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 uh the lead-ins or whatever the uh, for the next one it's gonna be really bad uh oh. and i don't know if that will be the uh and it's gonna be directed by Claude Trevorrow. I don't know if that will be the, you know, maybe the the thing that finally doesn't work with dinosaurs because evidently the only dinosaurs that people don't like is the good dinosaur from Pixar, <laughs> 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 which I liked. Um, but uh, but yeah, they it's gonna be really really terrible. So I interesting. I, That's intriguing. Yeah, yeah. I I mean I don't want to give spoilers. Uh, in case you do have to see it, but it's uh, they they went away a certain way with a plot that oh uh, I don't know wasn't a fan of, but I still think it was a little bit better. I walked out of it being at least a little entertained, <laughs> like again it's sort of another like C I'd give it like C plus, huh. or C. <laughs> I know a lot of other people were like it's the worst thing to ever exist, but. I think for some reason, I it, uh, it seems like people on YouTube that liked the first one, like Jurassic World, really didn't like this. 
Um, hmm. And since I didn't like the first one, maybe that's my difference. I don't know. Anyway, it is what it is. It's kind of a hot mess, but it, I thought it at least had a director who was trying. So there you go. So right. So <laughs> um, next we have Incredibles 2. And this was our long awaited sequel. Uh, it made $597 million domestic uh, and a worldwide total of $1.14 uh, billion. So for Pixar. And I think it's deserved. I really enjoyed it. To me, it had it was a very well executed superhero movie with, I said, I, they felt like it was a, sort of a treatise on how hard it is to be a parent. And I really liked the fact that they didn't make Bob just like the stupid man, you know, stupid Mr. Mom kind of a thing. Like he's, he figures everything out. You know, he figures out new math. He figures out how to help Violet. Like he's not an idiot and, but he's just tired and it's hard. And, and I think a lot of parents really be able to relate to that. And I thought it was funny and I liked pretty much all of the characters. The villain is, eh, but I was okay with that. I guess in the end, everything else was so well executed. The action was really well done. I really liked the animation. So I was really entertained. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the action in this movie, it's really great. Yeah. Um, I have some problems with the movie, but I will say the things that I really love about it are the way in which Brad Bird, who I think is the best director to have worked with Pixar ever, and his movies are, for the most part, my favorite of the Pixar movies. I think he has an ability to sort of, uh, you push the animation and, you know, just, especially in this movie, not be afraid of going on this sort of tangents and in like things that are beautiful, just the movement of the characters. I think of the scene with Jack-Jack and the raccoon, for example, which is kind of a, you know, it's not essential to the plot, but it's just something that is so fun and so well done. And it shows all these great, use of superpowers which is another thing that i love about the movie is how it really understands how to use the superpowers to the to make the action sequences so great because you think of so many superhero movies one that we're going to be talking about really soon for example in which the heroes have these amazing powers but all they do is just punch each other like they're human but they have these amazing powers and they don't use them in this movie the heroes use their powers and i think that is great mm -hmm. yeah and they were really inventive i thought i, I really liked void she she was fun I, I liked that whole sequence uh when her and elastigirl were working together and creating right. the, the black holes or whatever the voids mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> um, really, i loved the whole scene with edna it was hilarious i <laughs> and it, the whole thing is mm -hmm. uh parenting when done well is a heroic act and i thought that was kind <laughs> of the theme of the whole theme of the movie and, and uh yeah really enjoyed it uh it had yeah. some controversy because it actually had some swear words which had never happened in oh uh, right right any, right 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 uh, Pixar movie i didn't even notice to be completely honest uh mm -hmm. um because, i don't know i just didn't and i mean it's uh, not it's and, not like they dropped one of the like you know most <laughs> Right. offensive swear words it was like you know a pretty yeah. tough one but still yeah. like i can imagine it being kind of similar to when i was a little girl and would watch sleeping beauty and wolf uh -huh. says something like bring down all the powers of hell it's just something of that effect and i used to think that was like so scandalous <laughs> Right, 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 right. So like, wow, she, <laughs> she's super <laughs> evil. Um, <laughs> so probably have that, maybe have that kind of, <laughs> kind of effect. Um, and it did have some uh, strobe light concerns by some people. Yeah, you know, a, a pretty cool sequence, but I, I do think that was the thing that I was surprised that it was just there without any sort of warning or anything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know, it's a, it's an interesting. It's an interesting thing, uh, but I think uh, where would you rank it as far as the as the Pixar sequels? Sequels, 
Um, I think outside of the Toy Story movies is probably the best one for me. Uh-huh. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's tough. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's really hard. I, you're probably right empirically. I kind of, I appreciate Monsters University a lot more than other people do because I think mm-hmm. that it was really bold of them to have a narrative where the character does not achieve their dreams. <laughs> that was like really interesting for a kid's movie. So I mm-hmm. think it's a little underrated, but just County Brass Tacks, it's probably the best outside of the Toy Story movies. But anyway. Yeah. So, all right. Now we've got the big... Oh, but of, just one more thing. Incredible okay. 2 with uh, 597 million is now the highest grossing of all of Pixar's movies, yeah. right? It's number I one. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is amazing. Yeah. So there you go. Look at that. Uh, so then we have the big kahuna himself, Avengers Infinity War. This mm-hmm. thing made $678 million domestic total. Da, 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 $2.45 billion at the box office. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, so uh, this is proving more is best at the box office. And overall, I thought it was pretty entertaining. I enjoyed a lot of the sequences. I thought that Thanos was pretty intimidating, pretty scary. Uh, he was. I liked the fact that they made sort of the henchmen really tough to defeat. It wasn't like in Ultron where you know they're just sort of mindless, uh, you know, ro- like robots. Uh, easy for them to defeat. Like these these henchmen were were tough, and so that kind of made it interesting. And I liked that, and I really liked the little like pairings that we got. I loved. Uh, seeing tony and dr strange together that was really fun i really liked uh, star lord and thor together that was really fun uh and of course in this kind of thing there are going to be people that you wish you'd see more of but overall i was entertained i did not like the ending i thought it was super manipulative and lame and (laughs) And i was not a fan i don't like when i feel like the directors of films think i'm stupid because I'm not stupid. I know that Spider-Man isn't going anywhere. Like, don't try to get me to cry over a scene where I'm supposed to feel like Spider-Man is dead in quotation marks. Yeah, right. Like, I think if they had had some of the older characters die and it had been like the younger characters who were going to have to kind of take, Mm -hmm. that would have made way more sense and it would have at least felt like semi-plausible to me. But you know that's what's going to happen in the next movie, so they can't spoil it now. Yeah, it was just like, I don't know, it just, I if, it kind of reminded me, of, I think it's a much better movie than Batman v Superman, but like, it was the same sort of frustration I felt with the ending of that movie, where I'm like, I know that Superman is going to be in Justice League, I'm not an idiot, and so like, you're expecting me to feel all this emotion of the death of Superman, when I'm not an idiot, like, it, it, that irritates me, I feel manipulated. And uh, I've kind of felt that way here, and I didn't like it. Uh, But everything else up until then, I really liked. So I thought it was good. Hmm. Um, My review of this movie is, who cares? I'm just tired of this superhero Marvel stuff. I -hmm. think this is really, this movie was so bloated, and it felt so not like a movie to me. It just felt like a... I don't know. It was like watching a presentation for a toy line or something. I just felt exhausted and it was so, it went on and on and the ending was like so clearly not, you know, it was clearly going to be redone in the next movie. I just, at the end, I felt like, I don't know. I just felt like, why am I spending my time watching these movies? I could do other things. So I think outside of the ones that I'm really interested in, which obviously I went to see Ant-Man because I think the first one was funny and I thought the second one was. And then I'll probably go and see the Black Panther sequel. But other than that, I don't know if I'm going to keep watching these Marvel movies, to be honest. Mm-hmm. I think this is somehow the straw that broke the camel's back for me. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I can, I can understand that. <laughs> I mean, I've been surprised that you've continued to see them as long as you have. To be I, I am as well. <laughs> you know, a lot of the time it's because my friends want to go see them, and I, sure. you know, want to hang out with my friends, and so I go along. But I think, uh, yeah, if I think starting now, if it's not for that, I'd probably not, just not gonna bother. You're not at all curious to kind of how they finish it off. In, in the I mean, I, I will. I will learn about it regardless because everyone's going to be talking about yeah, it. That's so I, that's what I sort of thought. It's like, I really don't need to go to see the movie to know what happens. Right. Yeah. Everyone's going to tell me anyway. And I really don't enjoy watching the movie that much. So I think it's a pretty good deal. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. That's totally fair. Uh, yeah. I mean, overall, I'd give it like a, for me, I'd give it like a B. Uh, and I know most people are like, it's the greatest you know, Marvel movie ever. People were into I, it, right? oh yeah most people i know love it and i thought one of my friends did make i think a pretty good point about the ending that like from his perspective it's not that it's sad that they're dead it's sad that they like to have superheroes lose and mm. lose so dramatically which i thought was kind of an interesting take and i appreciated you know i appreciated that that kind of take on it that's an interesting point i did like that a little bit the yeah. idea of like you know, having the ears lose at the end of the movie was, I think that was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Before we did our predictions back in probably April, um, we had a discussion on whether or not we should include Avengers Infinity War as a summer movie because it got pushed from May to the right. last week of April. And traditionally, the summer movie season starts in May, even though May is not really summer, but right. you know, whatever. That's traditionally it goes from May to the end of August. Um, but now we're seeing all these movies who are sort of like big, big blockbusters. You know, Black Panther, biggest movie of the year, released yeah. in February. We've seen movies being released in April and March for a while now. And I think I am not okay with that. I think the summer should remain officially from May to August. So what I want to say on this podcast today is that starting next year, we should only consider movies that open between May and August. <laughs> and, you know, if they, yeah. we have a similar situation to Avengers Infinity War next year, I vote for not including it in our prediction. Uh, I don't know how you feel about that. I'm okay with that. I do actually like the fact that we're getting these films all year and that it's not just in the summer. But... I'm okay with that for the course of our predictions. Uh, Box Office Mojo actually doesn't include, didn't include uh, Infinity War in their summer uh, ranking. So it's interesting uh, to see uh, see that. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, I just think it's a, it's like, oh, it's like opening a can of worms because when is it going to end? You know, first it's the last week of April and then it's the second to last week of April and then we're in March and then we're in January, you know, like it's, yeah. we have to draw the line somewhere. It's like, Hallmark with, it. it's like Hallmark with Christmas movies, you know, it's just like they're, having, like, say, they're yeah. having Christmas in April, they're having Christmas in August, like <laughs> <laughs> all year long, we just have summer all year long. <laughs> uh yeah so that sounds good we can do that so real quick the uh the international box office uh was right. pretty fun uh we had uh number 10 was hotel transylvania 3 number nine was skyscraper uh number oh, eight oh did well internationally yeah which is the rock is the biggest big star overseas huh yeah, and I actually thought it was fine. I don't understand the. I thought it was entertaining. I enjoyed it. Like, it's not like a greatest movie I've ever seen, but I had yeah. a pretty cool scene, uh, a fight scene in this like whole room with mirrors that I thought was pretty fun. And I and I liked the fact that Nev Campbell's character, she was just like strong, but she wasn't like a cliched warrior woman. But she wasn't like a damsel in distress. I thought she was actually a pretty good character for this kind of character and it was silly and over the top but i thought it was pretty entertaining i enjoyed it i lo- i didn't mind watching it so anyway i didn't get to see it yeah um number eight is called us and them this is china release Ooh. yeah <laughs> um and then and it made 212 million dollars uh <laughs> in china um okay That's and then them. Yes. Do you know what it's a, what it is about? Um, I don't. 
here's what I have for a synopsis. It says, two strangers meet in a train and form a bond that evolves over the years. After a separation, they reconnect and reflect on their love for each other. So a romantic movie, I'm, I'm yeah. guessing. That sounds good. Interesting to see, you know, I'm sort of like a, I don't hear any like explosions or <laughs> robots or superheroes. So interesting. It looks like it's going to come to Netflix in the U.S. All right. Look at that. Okay. So let's keep an eye out for it. <laughs> Us it and them. Uh, then at number seven, we have Ant-Man and the Wasp. And right. then uh, we have a movie called Hello, Mr. Billionaire in China. Oh, hello, Mr. Billionaire. <laughs> this is a comedy. <laughs> um, Both a Chinese movie, huh? Yeah. And it says, a pathetic minor league soccer goalkeeper was given a task to spend $1 billion in 30 days. If successful, he will get $30 billion. However, he's not allowed to tell anyone about the task, and he must not own any valuables by the end of it. So, hmm. there you go. That sounds like a bit of a familiar premise. Isn't there... I feel like I heard something like this before. I don't know if it was a movie or some a play or something. Maybe. But I've heard maybe. this story about giving someone money and then they have to spend it. Oh, it looks like it's I based on a I've movie called The Brewster's Million. Oh, Brewster's Millions, right. That's what it is. Have you heard of that? Yeah, of course. That's with I think that's with Richard Pryor. Yeah. From nineteen eighty five. Oh. Richard Pryor and John Candy. Yeah. That makes sense. That sounds familiar to me. So there you go. Chinese yeah. remake. <laughs> so hello, Mr. Billionaire. Doing really well. International box office. Then we have a number five, Deadpool 2. Uh, yeah. And then a movie called number four, we have Dying to Survive. This was the top at China. Ooh. This is called a Dying to Survive. <laughs> this is a story on how a small drugstore owner became the exclusive selling agent of a cheap Indian generic drug against chronic granulocytic leukemia in China. Wow, wow, so it seems like a bit of a like a Dallas Buyers Club, huh? Yeah, uh, yeah. The Chinese market. Yeah. Interesting. These Chinese movies, I yeah, wouldn't have expected these sort of like they seem like these comedy dramas that are making lots of bank. Yeah, look at that. The, the IMDb says, this is one of the best Chinese movies in history. So, Oh, wow. There you go. All right. Who said that? Mr. IMDb. <laughs> it's just an IMDb reviewer. I don't know. Uh, Evan9103. <laughs> <That's>, mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're lucky okay, you live well. in New York. You might actually get, you could possibly see some of these if you wanted. Um, well, we all know that Evan Nine One and Three is one of the most respected film <laughs> critics out there. So, yeah. gotta take his word for it. Uh, then, uh, Incredibles Two is third place. Jurassic World: Fallen Kingdom is second place. It did super mm -hmm. well in China and uh, and overseas. And uh, mm -hmm. and then Avengers: Infinity War number one. So, That's right there. there you go so that is a uh that is the international box office so uh it's fun to see some of these different areas coming out with their own films and i feel like it seems like uh i mean last year i did better about seeing some of these films and i enjoyed all the ones i actually saw so mm -hmm. the big yeah. foreign hits i mean i loved bahubali uh, then that was right. last year, but that was Indian, and that was so good. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's great. Anyway, okay, so let's talk real quick about some indies that we want to recommend uh, from the summer mm -hmm. that you might not have seen. And mm -hmm. I have a couple. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a great, I have some documentaries real quick that I loved. One that just came out on Hulu uh, that I saw at Sundance, uh, but it just came out in in august called minding the gap is great oh. uh it's he managed to like follow his friends this guy for from a, such an early age and just get all of these interviews and and it's really actually a film about domestic violence and how it affects boys which i thought was you don't normally see that as much which was really interesting and how you know what kind of men they become when they're raised in homes where their mothers are abused and mm. that was really interesting to me 
And of course it has, you know, the skateboarding and uh, it's also a movie about friendship. It was really good. Uh, another one. Interesting. Yeah. And that's on Hulu, huh? That's it's available Hulu. to watch right now on Hulu. Yeah. Great. It's, it's definitely catch up with that. Yeah, it's really good. Um, and then another documentary I loved was Three Identical Strangers. I mm. try everything you can. Uh, if you're listening, try to not be spoiled. <laughs> like, I'm normally not a spoiler person, but the twist that happened, I just was my mouth on the floor. I was shocked. Mm. And I thought it was just crazy and really entertaining. And I don't know, really liked it. And I really love Will You Be My Neighbor. I've actually seen it three times because it was just uh, so yeah. sweet and so it's made me feel magic. good. Um, I loved Leave No Trace. That was when I saw it at Sundance uh, and I saw it twice and more because I just love the performances wow. and I love the story and I just think it's so moving and I love it. And it's my favorite movie of 2018. And wow! I, yeah, I've heard I've heard nothing but good things, but I didn't yeah. catch it in the theater because I wasn't in New York when it was out. Oh. But I definitely want to catch up with it. I I just I just love it. Pretty much everything about it. I just think it's great. Um, and I also loved an anime film called Makia When the Promised Flower Blooms. This is directed by Mariah Okada, and it's really cool. We're starting to see out of anime some female directors which is really neat uh and uh uh, you know it's just new for the genre which makes me happy but this movie was so ambitious (laughs) it's a fantasy story uh about this girl who kind of it's kind of like the elves in um in lord of the rings uh she she's got some immortality but like they can be killed you know they can be murdered um but uh, anyway, so her village gets attacked, and she runs into the forest, and she finds a baby, a human baby, there, and she decides to raise it. So the, actually, the core of the movie is about this woman becoming a mother, this girl becoming oh. a mother. And so it has this, like, real heart to it, and there's a couple other characters, but it also has, like, all the fantasy stuff that are, you know, like, it has dragons, and it has, I mean, it's it's very ambitious and beautifully animated, beautiful music and i really really liked it so that's one that i would say seek out if you can um for makia when the promised flower blooms uh, so and i oh. also one more i loved the guernsey literary and potato peel pie society uh, <laughs> <laughs> i loved the book and uh this stars lily james it went straight to netflix which bummed me out because i would have loved to see it in the theaters uh, but it has a great cast, Jessica Brown Finley, Matthew Good, Mike, Michael Heisman, uh, and he's super dreamy as her romantic lead. It's very sweet. It's very, Glenn Powell's in it. It's just, uh, I love Penelope Wilton is in it. She's great. Uh, it's a little bit slow for some people, but for me, I just loved it. I thought it was so good and so romantic. So that's mm-hmm. my recommendations uh, for yeah. smaller films. What about you? Um, so let me see. What did I see this summer? I really enjoyed Mission Impossible, which we talked about. I also really liked Eighth Grade, which I mm-hmm. thought was really, um, really, you know, truthful and realistic portrayal of what it's like to be in that age and, the, you know, the problems of uh, adolescence. Um, I think my favorite movie of the summer or the one that I think is, probably the best movie that I saw this summer is uh, Black Clansman mm-hmm. by Spike Lee, um, which has generated a lot of conversation. I think we had director Boots Riley, who's the director of Sorry to Bother You, which also came out this summer, um, sort of make some critiques about the movie, about how it portrayed police, that maybe it was uh, portraying them in a uh, too favorable a light given what actually happened because it's based on this true story about this you know black police officer who infiltrated the kkk back in the 70s mm-hmm. and um so he had a lot to say about it there's a lot of people who have a lot of uh critiques about it and then there's a lot of people who like me really enjoyed and really uh think the movie is really great and i think 
not only do I think the movie is really great, but I also think these conversations about the movie, I think, are really cool because even when people don't like it or have problems with it, I think the people are really talking about the movie and not just about, you know, sometimes we talk about movies and we complain about things that aren't really the movie, but I think there's been a lot of conversation about what the choices that the director made are in the movie and what we should put in a movie and what we shouldn't do in a movie and how movies relate to reality and to history and all that sort of conversations that I think are really cool and really uh, exciting to have. And also, I think that conversation is kind of what the movie is trying to go for. So that's why I think it's a great movie. But anyway, I think it's definitely worth seeing. It's like, you know, Spike Lee is such a daring director in so many ways and he just goes straight for it he's not a subtle man he just goes for what he wants to say and makes big decisions and sometimes they pay off sometimes they don't i think in this case they do and they definitely generate a lot of things to talk about so i definitely recommend it to everyone who's interested in movies in general Um, yeah i agree with you i really enjoyed it it's number 11 on my ranking for the year so it's pretty high up i really thought it was great i thought it was really well acted the adam driver was great in his role Mm -hmm. uh you know playing this jewish man that has to play this part of this hateful redneck i thought that was actually really interesting kind of layer and uh i I thought it was hard for me as a huge Topher Grace fan to see him play in David mm-hmm. Duke. That was like very like hard, but it was great. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, so it was, I really enjoyed it. Like you definitely, I felt like he was kind of self-indulgent at times with the way that he shot it and the way that he mm-hmm. put it together and some of his music choices and other stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But overall, and also like, I get the ending and why it's important, but it, I do I do think certain things about it felt a little self indulgent, but I still mm. really enjoyed it. It's like one of my you know top of the year, so I liked it. Mm. I was not a fan of Sorry to Bother You. <laughs> I don't know. Mm. I just felt like that movie, like it for the like the first thirty minutes, I was like super entertained. I thought it was really interesting, and then I just felt like they just like threw up every idea that they had and like put it on mm-hmm. screen to the point of exhaustion and i i just he was trying to say so many things all in one movie and he, you know it's like the whole uh, chanel number five i mean the whole uh, coco chanel advice of uh of take mm, where you leave the take house the take jewelry. one thing off <laughs> and I right, think right, 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 he right. should have done that like he was just trying to comment on so many things and have this this crazy you know horse thing and i don't know it was just too much for me uh, and I didn't end up um, doing it, but yeah, I think yeah. both movies, uh, "Sorry to Bother You" and "Black Klansman," definitely sort of very creative and very original and very sort of going for broke in what they want to do and making bold choices. Which I think mm-hmm. some of them work better than others, but I think in general, I find it very exciting that we have these movies that are making these, you know, big decisions uh, in the way they're being made. And speaking of that, I have one other recommendation for a really small independent movie, which um, I know it was playing here in New York, and I think it must have been in L.A. I don't know if it's going to play theaters uh, across the country because it's really tiny, but you're probably going to be able to see it on VOD or something soon. And that's called Madeline's Madeline, which was at Sundance. And it's this movie about this um, girl who uh, has, problems you know she's a teenager and she has uh i guess it's not totally clear what her deal is but she seems to be struggling with sort of like some kind of depression or like mental issues and she joins a theater troupe in order to sort of work these things out and then it's sort of the story goes from there and transforms in this really weird way about performance and how her personal life is playing into the sort of play that these troupe is performing and it's a really interesting story told in a very interesting way it is a very artsy movie so Mm. be warned that it's like very opaque and it's very from her point of view it's hard to follow at the beginning and then you kind of get to understand what's going on but it's it's really weird but it's really well done the main actress is this teenage girl called helena howard and she's amazing in the movie she gives an amazing performance and the movie is really great i would recommend it to anyone who 
has the ability to watch it. Cool. Yeah, I, I vaguely remember hearing about that. Uh, so great. Yeah, there's been a lot of really fun little indie mov- movies uh, that have come out. Uh, there were a lot of little surprises. I, I think Searching is just coming out. That one's really good. I saw that at Sundance. Uh, I actually really enjoyed Teen Titans Go to the Movies. I thought it was yeah. hilarious. I laughed harder than I have, it, except for Game Night. <laughs> I don't movie. Cool. I thought it was really funny, but that's just me. Um, and uh, yeah, that, the biggest disappointment for me was The Meg. I thought it was super lame. Um, I didn't like it. So um, that was the dud for me, even though it almost made the top 10. <laughs> I thought it was just boring and i loved 47 meters i'm one of the few people who thought 47 meters down was super mm. fun last year so i love shark oh, movies interesting. i thought the meg was yeah. yeah so oh well what are you gonna do so i don't know if i had a disappointment this season um i think most of what i saw i thought was pretty good or there was nothing that i was had high expectations for that didn't deliver so i think it was a pretty good summer at least for me, I, you know, again, mm-hmm. I didn't see all that was out there. A lot of movies that I skipped that I didn't think yeah. I was going to enjoy. I was also disappointed with Tully, even though it was a great performance. I thought the ending was so disappointing. And it was, it, I actually, um, uh, my, the, the, the projector stopped working at a, like an hour. And I was like, this is such a great movie. I love it. And then, ugh, I don't know. I thought it was, why did they make that choice? It was so disappointing to me. Um, so that was a bummer for me because I was really excited because I love Jason Reitman and, uh, you know, their work together and Dablo Cody is like one of my all time favorites, you know, because I love Juno so much. And so anyway, that was disappointing to me uh, just because it gets mm. so much right. And then, ugh, anyway so yeah it but overall it has been a pretty darn good summer i would say and uh so uh let us know in the comment section what you liked what you saw this uh summer and uh what you think of the box office and what things scored and what things didn't score and uh how you think that will affect decision making coming up let us know uh, in the comment section or on twitter uh it'll be a lot of fun so uh, Karada, where can people find you? Um, you can find me mostly on Twitter at Coco Hits New York, or you can follow my blog, which, you know, it's kind of dormant at this point, but I do write on it every once in a while. And that is Coco Hits NY.wordpress.com. Okay, great. Uh, and you can find me at Rachel's Reviews on iTunes and on YouTube. And if you can put in your reviews on iTunes, it really helps. And put your thumbs up uh, on YouTube if you're watching, if you're listening there. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks again. This is always so much fun. Yeah, thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. <laughs> um, we will talk again soon. Great. Bye.